Welcome to the Bible Truth of Our Hymns. We're going to look at a hymn from a hymnal and check it to see if that hymn is biblically sound or not. There are stanzas in the hymns or words that are not correct from the Bible. We need to see that in a church where there are three types of people. Number one, they're saved and serving and loving the Lord. Number two, they're saved and they're worldly. And number three, lastly, they're lost men. Jesus said, every idle word shall man give an account. Are we proposing men and women in the church to sin by the hymns that are chosen? We will examine some, but not all, in this study. We will set a groundwork that the sin, that the sin, the hymn that we missed, you can be able to check for yourself and study yourself to see is this hymn that I like correct now not all the hymns that we're going to look at will be wrong many will be great and wonderful hymns and a few will have to be is it really proper will it glorify God or will it cause a man to sin The biblical truth of our hymns today to God be the glory and we have Fanny J Crosby she's a missionary worker poet composer she was a member of the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church in Brooklyn New York she wrote many hymns great ones together with her minister Robert Lurie at six weeks old, Crosby caught a cold and developed inflammation of the eyes. And from there, her troubles began, and yet more and more did she grow in the grace of God. And many things were applied to treat the discharges, mustard, and stuff like that. And according to Crosby, her procedure damaged her optic nerve and blinded her. But modern physicians think that the blindness was more likely conge congenital and gave her her age may have simply not have been noticed by her parents so we have a young girl her most of her entire life blinded blinded by doctors and miracle cures and when you read her hymns and when you sing her hymns, you will see a touch that no other blindness can see. Because she speaks about seeing Jesus. Now, although raised in a Presbyterian household, Dwayne converted to his mother's baptism faith. And we're looking at the music of William, who came up with the, the part of this, uh, for this hymn while a young student at Woodstock Academy. This conversion began a lifelong service to the church through his musical compositions, choir directions, and denom uh, denominational leadership. So we have set forth two people here that love the Lord, saved, and it's miraculous. And how God used his own, this lady, this woman, this dear saint. And like Joseph, there's no complaining. So when we start off, we go to God be the glory. What other glory is there? Ain't my glory. Ain't her glory. Ain't no one else's glory. But oh, we glory about sports. We glory about grades. We glory about cars and, and sin. But to God be the glory, great things he has done and what wonderful things he, he has done, he is doing, and he will do. One testimony. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten words already. And what glorification. 
10 words and you can throw out any modern hymn that, you know, just repeats and with a jungle beat and repeats with a jungle beat. So loved he the world that he gave his he gave us his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now notice what Miss Crosby does. That we have seen in some hymns before. They quote the verse and then they change it. And I gotta say, hey, listen, what's wrong with changing the verse as King James Bible believers? And she runs to John 3.16, but she does not quote John 3.16. She does, she does not change John 3.16. And yet you see it there. So loved he the world that he gave, his, gave us his son. And she's speaking of herself. She has applied John 3.16 to herself. And she's not doing so she can find a word that rhymes with son. We have seen that with other hymns. Oh, we gotta change the scripture so we can rhyme the next line in the next lyrics. Who yielded his life an atonement for sin? So we have God loving the world, and we have the Son yielding his power and glory. And open the life gate that all may go in. Not she's not a Calvinist. Oh, whosoever. Miss Crosby has taken John 3.16 and put it to a person's own love and dearness with a handicap of blindness to say, I am loved by God. And anybody, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. And they will. That second advent, Christ will come with that sword out of his mouth. Anger. But once the goat nations are separated and the sinners are, are cast off, oh, the voice that will sing throughout the, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Some people say, you know, say to me as a, a public minister of the gospel, oh, Jesus would not do this. Jesus would not sound like, you don't know what Jesus sounds like. And let the earth hear his voice. I'm waiting for that. I'm waiting to hear come up hither because that's the next time, that's the only time I will have heard Jesus Christ outside the scriptures. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through, did I, do, do, I, do I dare say the next word? Do I dare to say a word that has been not put into other hymns, Jesus the Son. So we got three stanzas. We got three times we're going to sing the chorus. Three times we see Jesus the Son. That's a lot better than some of the other hymns that we've gone through. This is the eighth hymn we're do doing so far, if I counted right. And give him the glory. Give Jesus the Son the glory. You mean not the baseball team? Not the football team? Not the basketball team? Great things he has done. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Jesus the Son, give him the glory, great things he has done. Penny Crosby is not a Jehovah Witness. Because she has put the attributes of God and she has applied them to the Son, Jesus Christ. She has glorified God and Jesus as one. Remarkable. Oh, perfect redemption. What other redemption is there? Oh, yeah, I could bring my soda cans back to the store and get my nickel. And the cans could be washed. They may not be washed. They're supposed to be washed. But what kind of redemption is that? How about the redemption that we read in the book of Ruth, chapter 4, when Boaz says, I have purchased my wife. And he said, oh, what did he do, buy money for her? No, he had purchased. Purchased, which means 
I have redeemed. I have bought her. And it's the church type of group. Jesus Christ has redeemed us. He has bought us back from Satan with his blood. Acts 20:28, 20, which is the blood of God. It was a price for Jesus Christ. There was a price of God that we may be redeemed. Oh, perfect redemption. Perfect on what aspect? The sinless blood of Jesus Christ. Perfect on what, what application? That Jesus Christ was sinless. Perfect on what standing? On the blood of God. Acts 20:28. 20, the purchase of blood. As we just said that. The purchase of blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. I got baptism. I got church membership. I give money. That's not the purchase for redemption by the hands of God. God will only receive the blood. I am the way, the truth, and the life, said Jesus. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, and by him is through the blood. Are you washed in the blood? To every believer, every believer, those that have believed on the finished work of Jesus Christ, the promise of God, God has made promises to believers of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I am going to get you. I will not deny you if you don't deny me. I will no wise cast you out. The vilest offender who truly believes. You take the most wickedest sinner, the most wickedest sin that you can think of. And they had trust on Jesus Christ, they are saved. But let's look at what the Bible says. Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. It's not sins. There's no degrees of sin when it comes to the Lamb of God. We are all vile sinners in the eyes of God. No matter what we've done. No matter compared to you, compared to me, compared to them, compared to those... You, you've done that, you've done that, you've done that, and you did this, and I did that. There's no comparison. Our sins, without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, would bring us into hell. Violence. You know what the population of hell is? Miss Crosby has put it in our words. The vilest offenders. Those are the ones that are in hell. The cute little grandma who's supposedly so innocent, the cute, you know, and also as long as vile, wicked people, sex offenders, and rapists, and, you know, murderers. In hell with the vile offenders with little old ladies. Young, innocent men. But Lord, didn't we... Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. I was a vile offender one time. I came to Calvary's cross. I got down on my knees. I said, Lord, I need to repent. I need to get right. I need your son. I need to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ to be cleansed and to be right with you. Righteousness is by Jesus Christ alone. Other than that, you're a vile offender. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care what pedestal you put yourself on. Without Jesus Christ, you're a vile offender. That moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. Now, let's look at pardon for a minute. She speaks about what is a pardon. A pardon is a document that states you have been absolved from all crimes penalties, sins, anything that you have done wrong against the government, against the people, against someone, person, place, or thing. You have been absolved, you have been given clearance, you have been given freedom by a pardon. Now, pardon is an interesting word because I can go into any prison in the world today. Anywhere where there's a prison, where there's people, I can walk in that prison and hold pardons. And say, I am going to give you people pardons. But the problem <coughs> excuse me, with a pardon is, you have to be guilty. 
If I come up to you and say, what are you in jail for? Oh, I didn't do nothing wrong. I can't give you a party. Oh, I'm in here for, I stole money from the bank. Did you steal the money from the bank? Oh, no, no, I was framed. I can't give you a party. And you cannot come to the cross of Jesus and say, well, look how wonderful I am. God will not give you a pardon. You cannot walk up to the cross of Jesus and say, Jesus, the membership of the church that I am in, you cannot receive a pardon. Well, look how much money, look how much time I've given to this thing. You can't receive a pardon. The day that I received my pardon from God, I got down on my knees and said, God, I'm a sinner. And there's some many sins I could list. And acknowledging my crime against God called sin. Acknowledging to the government that you have done a crime. And you acknowledge to the government that you're guilty. A pardon can be given to you. Now, I wonder... We have a tradition in America, if you're outside of America, that every four years, upon the exit of the President of the United States of office, even if he gets voted into another term, he is, is able to hand out pardons to people in the government who are in jails. Uh, I don't know how many it is, but he is, under his presidential authority, allowed to give pardons out to people of the United States. Now, my question is, because it makes big news, you know, he let this person go, he let that person go, he let them... Did those people confess to the President of the United States, whoever he is, Mr. President, I'm guilty of the crimes that I am here for, and I am sorry for the crimes. Truly sorry. Truly repent. And I do not want to do it again, even if I need to get help to get away from that crime. I'm sorry. And if there is no repentance and to make things right, that's not a pardon. It's a get out of jail free card that you can buy in a game. Then we go praise the Lord again, praise the Lord. And we talk about Jesus the second time. Jesus is able to give you a pardon. But in order to get that pardon, you have got to come as a sinner. You're not sin you don't think you ever sinned? Don't come to don't come to Calvary. Don't do listen, tell me, Christian, if you got somebody who is not acknowledging that they are a sinner, you don't go any further. It's a sin. I don't care how many prayers they say upside down all around and on their knees and on their faces, whatever. If they do not acknowledge that they, Jesus Christ is their Savior and they need to repent of their sins to receive the blood atonement of the cross, if they're not a sinner, they won't get saved. They won't get that pardon. Pardon means you have to announce your guilt. I don't care what your pastor says. I don't care what your grandma says. It's what the Bible says. Great things he has taught us. Oh, through the word of God. Now, according to Jesus in John chapter 14, who teaches us? I'm not, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm miscorrect in John 14. In the Gospel of John, who does Jesus say teaches us? The Holy Spirit. He will guide and teach us in all truth. So, Miss Crosby has got God, she's got Jesus, and she's got the Holy Spirit. She's got the Holy Trinity in her poem. These are poems written by her. And turn to be hymns. I think churches need to be singing more Fanny Crosby hymns than any other crap that's out there. Okay? There's plenty of crap that's being sung in the churches. I can use the word dung. Great things he has taught us. Great things he has done. John says at the end of his gospel, we can't even comprehend to write down everything that Jesus has done. It'd be volumes and volumes and volumes. 
you would probably need every tractor trailer that Walmart owns to carry everything that Jesus done. You imagine, Pastor? Okay. All right, open up your tractor trailer number four hundred thirty-six <laughs> on the left side of the truck. <laughs> four pallets down, three from the top, second row. <laughs> All the great things. See, it's not just saving our souls. Think about the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Think about the prophecies that Jesus will fulfill. Think about your new body. Think about the painlessness you'll get. Think about the glory of New Jerusalem. Think about that Jesus had patience and long-suffering dealing with the Jews. Thinking about Jesus trying to be patient with those disciples that did not get it. And the patience of God towards the Jews, even though they're stiff-necked, even though they just rebelled against him, God tried and tried and tried and tried to get them to do right. Now let's look at my life. God tries to get me to do right, and I don't. I fight against him. I go against him. I sin against him. And yet God says, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin. One of the great things that God has done for me is what I don't have. He's had patience. And long suffering. And I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not mine. There is absolutely no righteousness of me at all. Ever, never, has never been. And great are rejoicing through Jesus. Oh, that's for Jesus is now. In this hymn. I said that I think this is the eighth hymn. And Jesus was absent. On many of them. Acts 4. There is no other name given amongst men. Whereby you must be saved. And him supposedly to Jesus. Remove Jesus. Him. Let's give him a name. When you say Jesus, you say Jehovah saves. Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory, when Jesus we will we say to me. Are you looking for the blessed hope? As you're attending college college classes today, that you want to get the big shot of your career today, are you sitting there at that desk and saying, oh, I wish Jesus came right now? Are you sitting at the bleachers of a, of a game, your son's game, or your daughter's game, or your, your pro ball team saying, oh, at this moment, I wish Jesus would come? There's coming a day, my friend, whether we are living or are passed on to the next generations, Jesus is coming. He will come. Titus 2.13 describes that as the blessed hope. What's your blessed hope? Oh, I can't wait till Black Friday comes. Can't wait till Christmas when I get that present. Can't wait for my vacation. Can't wait to go on the cruise. And that will pass on in time. I am 48 years old right now. I've lived through 25 Christmas, uh, 48 Christmases. I don't know why I said 25. Oh, December 25th. 48 Christmases. Everybody looks forward to Christmas. So what? They're gone and dead. And all, most of those presents are gone. Well, that moment when Jesus comes, that's it. Forever to be with Jesus. Forever to be sinless, forever to be perfection, forever no more pain and sorrow and, and suffering, a new body, forever to be with the one that loved for me. Now, that's not high on your list. You get down in a room somewhere alone, close the door, get on your knees, get right with God. Because if you're not looking for Jesus to come, you're not right with God. Plain and simple. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
let the earth hear his voice. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. That was the words of Jesus. Let them hear that words. Let the lost world hear the word of God through the King James 1611 Bible. Don't you give them that other messy Bibles out there. John 1 says the word is God. 1 John 5 says the word is God. How's the world going to hear the word of God through you, Christian? Through gospel tracts, we're preaching by talking open Bible. On your car with bumper stickers. On your house with, with lettering. Your shirts, your hats. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. I'm rejoicing. Oh, come to the Father. Through Jesus the Son. Now, let's bring the last time we're going to talk about this. Oh, come to the Father. I ain't talking about a man on this planet. I'm talking about God the Father through the Almighty. How do you get to him? Jesus the Son. Oh, oh. You know what Miss Crosby just did again? She quoted scripture. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's come to the Father through Jesus. This is loaded with scripture. And give him the glory, great things he has done. Now, let me raise one of my objections I have to doing this study. Okay? Song leader gets up in front of the church Sunday morning. Everyone open up your hymnals to whatever number, but to God be the glory. And then the piano starts playing, to God be the glory, great things he has done. I got a terrible voice, I won't finish. What are you going to do when a lost man in that church sings this hymn? He's lying. You would have a Christian that goes to church just because he wants to go to church and is not doing what God is doing. He's not living right. He picks up this hymn and starts singing with the church. He's lying. So by singing a hymn to people who shouldn't be in church, you know, invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite the world in. And that's why the church is in the condition she is in today. Glad to see him. Go through the book of Acts. They were not put into the church but until they were saved. So, if you were singing some of these hymns before church starts, before the preacher get up, okay, open your Bibles and, and go on with the message, you've already got three quarters of the congregation that are living a lie already. Again, I'm telling you, it needs to get up there and say, okay, open your hymnals to God be the glory, page such and such. Those that love the Lord, sing it out, rejoice, hallelujah. Let the angels hear you. So those who are not living right, have not done right this week, and you just don't care, do some thinking. Do some looking around the room that those who are doing right, and those in this room who have not ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior, read the words. And ask God to put these words in your heart, because these words are Scripture. Remember who the song, the first song leader was? Lucifer. The father of lies, John 8, 44. And if he's going to have somebody sing a hymn that they don't believe, that they don't want to believe, that they don't ever want to have anything to do with it, and they get up and just sing, the 
why. But we made lies, polka dotted, green, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny. Uh, so lies, what do they mean anything? You know, if you're a politician, you're a liar. If you sell used cars, you're a liar. And lies are from Satan. But as far as to God be the glory, this is a great hand. This ought to be sung. This ought to be one of the first few pages. Let me ask you a question. You've heard this. We've all, those that are saved and loved, we have, we've heard this song. To God be the glory. And I guarantee if somebody would start humming it or, or playing it instrumentally, you probably would know the heart, the words of it in your heart. You would even put words that are your own singing glory to God. But let me ask you a question. In your church where you belong, wherever you are, when was the last time you sang to God be the glory? And what other hymns are you singing? This has got the Trinity. This has got praising God, praising Jesus, praising the Holy Spirit. It's got scripture. It explains the scripture. It tells you about the pardon. It tells you what happened when you got saved. What's wrong? Why is this not sung in churches? Why are they afraid of it? From a blind girl who got blind by medical procedures, right or wrong, and never held a grudge, to God be the glory, though I am blind. And look at this. One last thing about her. Uh, let me find it real quick here. Let me let me read the three the third stanza again. This. Great things he has taught us. Great things he has done. This is from a blind girl. She stayed. And great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory, when Jesus we see from a blind girl. Now, I don't know what the last thing she saw. I have no idea. I don't know what the last color she saw. If any. But you know what she's looking forward to? She's dead. She's going. She's in the ground. She's absent with the body and present with the Lord. And you know what she saw? She saw Jesus. You know what her dead body buried in the ground is going to see? That, that's blind. When the, when the rapture happens, it's going to see Jesus. When will we see Jesus? To God be the glory.